friends, thank you so much for being here this evening. I'm Rabbi Sarah Berman, the Director of Adult Education here at Central Synagogue. It's good to see so many familiar faces. It's so good to see so many new faces. And I want to especially thank the group of students from Stuyvesant High School who have joined us tonight. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to welcome our special guest this evening. Dr. Sylvia Smoller, a central congregant, is a scientist and a writer. She is the Distinguished University Professor and the Manealoff Molly Rosen, did I butcher that? Kind of. <laughs> Chair in Social Medicine Emerita in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. She is an authority in epidemiology and has made important research contributions in the areas of women's health, Hispanic health, and cardiovascular disease risk, and has been a leader in some of the key studies that have informed guidelines for medical practice in hypertension and in the use of hormone therapy. She is the recipient of the first Einstein Faculty Mentoring Award, of the Spirit of Achievement Award, and of the Presidential Medallion of Yeshiva University. Dr. Smoller has published more than 380 scientific papers and book chapters, as well as a textbook, Biostatistics and Epidemiology, a Primer for Biomedical and Health Professionals, the fourth edition. <laughs> and, and here's what really matters to us this evening. Before the Second World War, Dr. Smoller's father, Alexander Haftka, was the only Jew in the Polish government of independent Poland. Her parents' lives and her own were saved from the Holocaust by Chione Sugihara, who issued the family transit visa number 459, enabling them to escape through Japan to the United States. Sylvia has also written an historical novel about World War II called Chance and Consequence, and a book of poetry, The Human Condition. And now we get to hear from Dr. Sylvia Smoller. Thank you so much for the lovely introduction. Uh, can I just ask, can I advance the slides or how is that gonna work? Anyway, it is really a great honor for me to be. Okay, all right, then I have to look at the Okay. Um, really an honor to be here tonight, and I, I'm awed by the, by the audience, and very happy to see the young people from Stuyvesant High School here. It's wonderful that, that you young people want to hear these stories, because it's really important to, to tell them, and um, I, you know, given what's happening in the Middle East and in Israel, it seems uh, I'm humbled by telling a personal story, but you know, there are very few of us left to tell these stories. So while I'm here, I want to tell the story and I want this, particularly the young people to hear this story. So first I'm gonna give you a little background about what our life was like before the war, to give you context, what it was like during our escape and then after the war, and the central role that was played by Chuna Sugihara, who was the Japanese consul to Lithuania in 1941, or 1940-41. So uh, I wanna give you a little background of what our lives were like. Could you put the next slide on? Let me see if I can. First of all, I was born, my mother was born in a small shtetl in Poland. She was a beautiful woman, and, and the shtetl was your ordinary garden variety shtetl. Um, they lived, you know, with Polish uh, uh, peasants uh, together. There was not overt anti-Semitism in the village where they lived. They s somehow, they were separate, but they got along. And um, uh, it was a fairly prosperous family for the shtetl because they owned a leather curing factory, but she always wanted to get out of a small town. And she had that opportunity when she married my father and she was able to move to Warsaw. And um, as you just heard, he was in the Polish government b before the war started. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about his dismissal 
um, due to anti-Semitism, but that, that comes later. In any case, uh, I was born in Warsaw. Can you just click the slide? This is the map of Europe before, before um, the invasion. And um, uh, it's very distracting to be <laughs> looking back at these slides. Could you put the next slide in? All right, this, so this sh slide shows Warsaw before the war on the left there, and that's Marsh. Anybody been to Warsaw here? Mm -hmm. So you might recognize Marszałkowska Ulica. It's the main thoroughfare. And uh, on the bottom is the great synagogue of Warsaw, where um, we used to go in horse-drawn doroshkis mm. uh, to services. Only once a year, I have to say. Um, on the right is Warsaw in rubble after the war in 1945. And then on the bottom right is a picture of the street where I lived and where I was born. And it was reduced to rubble. Uh, OK, let's go on to the next slide, please. And this shows um, my mother before the war and my aunts and uncles walking happily along the street. And down on the bottom, my aunt and uncle, my grandmother. And so they, they lived a fairly happy life. And uh, next slide. And this is a, a picture of me as a little girl in Warsaw together with my parents. And I had, a, I guess, what was a fairly normal childhood until September 1st, 1939. And that was when Germany, of course, invaded Poland. Two days later, Britain and France, as well as Australia and New Zealand, declared war on Germany, and the United States uh, proclaimed neutrality at that time. My parents and most people widely believed that the war would be over in a couple of weeks because uh, Britain and France would get into the war and they would immediately defeat Hitler. So there was no question uh, that this was just a very short-lived thing. Um, and nobody uh, uh, expected that it would go on. But on September 17th, the Soviets invaded Poland, and the Nazis occupied Warsaw on September 27th. Uh, and of course, they went on to conquer all of Europe. And by the summer of 1940, they had already occupied France. And it began to look like they would, in fact, invade Great Britain. Next slide, please. This is a picture that I find extraordinary. It is my uncle, my grandmother, and my aunt on the wedding day of my uncle and my aunt. And you notice the startling thing about this picture. This is in 1940 in Sharky. He's wearing a yellow armband. And of course, they all had to wear yellow armbands. But they look perfectly content. It's his wedding day. And they have simply no idea of the horrors to come. And I think this point, and I want to make that point to the Stuyvesant students here in particular, the Holocaust did not start with gas chambers. It started with yellow armbands and other such things. And so this picture I find extremely important. Anyway, in the meantime, my mother's family um, remained in Jarki. And um, by 1942, next slide, please. The Germans had occupied all of Europe except Great Britain and Sweden. It's astonishing. It's just amazing. That's the red, the red part on the map. Meanwhile, in Warsaw, the bombardment was really pretty awful. And we were issued gas masks. And that was because of the experiences of the First World War, where gas warfare was you know, rampant. So we all had these gas masks. And there was a ch child's gas mask that I had. And when the siren sounded, we ran downstairs to the archway in the courtyard of our building because there were no regular bomb shelters and all the residents of the building ran down there. I mean, when you think about it, it was the stupidest shelter you could imagine because if the building came <laughs> tumbling down, we would be completely crushed, but nobody really knew what to do. Uh, and we stayed there until the all clear signal came. So the bombings were terrible. but. A week after the bombings had started, uh, and a couple of weeks before the Germans actually walked into Warsaw, my father had a visit from a co former colleague of his who said to him, you've got to get out. The Germans are you know, at the, at the door, and you have to get out, because women and children will be safe. 
but men will not be safe. And the government has already fled. The government has fled to Lublin, and you, and you have to go. Um, so, of course, my father wasn't going to take my mother and me with him because uh, he had been dismissed from the government a year before, in 1938 or end of 37, because a, a very right reactionary anti-Semitic government came into power. And after that, he became uh, the head of the refugees. The Germans had expelled Poles on the border into Poland, and he was one of the people helping to resettle these German Jews in Poland. And so he knew what it was like to be a refugee, and since everyone expected Britain and France to come and you know, get rid of this scourge, he wasn't gonna take us. But he went to the police station, which was across the street from us, and he demanded a car. The cars were all lined up there because they had been commandeered by the police station. And the police chief said no, of course, but he bluffed his way through it. He said he had been a government official and the government ordered him to join them in Lublin. So bluffing this way and that way, he managed to get a car and he was asked to pick a chauffeur. And he told my mother to pick the chauffeur from this lineup uh, while she, uh, he went across the street to pack. And she always told me she picked the handsomest chauffeur. He had very shiny boots and uh, he was very good looking, so she picked him. And we were now saying goodbye to my father, and this chauffeur that she picked said, but where's your wife and child? You have to take them because you can get them into the country away from the bombs. And he said, oh yes, that's a good idea. So within an hour, we were in that car with my father, and you know, it hinged on the fact that she picked that particular chauffeur. Another chauffeur might not have suggested such a thing, and obviously my father hadn't thought of it at that time. So we were heading out of Warsaw. Warsaw was in flames, of course. The bombings continued, uh, but the Germans had not yet invaded. But we made our way through small towns by freight train, by cart, by car, sometimes by ourselves, just the three of us, and sometimes with a small group of refugees who were also fleeing eastward. Uh, at one point we drove, we were driving, we didn't know where we were driving, we were just driving east. And my father said, well, if the government has gone south, then we will go north, because he thought that that was the safer thing to do. So he, we were going towards Pinsk. Anyway, well, at, one, at one point uh, uh, there was a German plane coming along. We had this chauffeur now who was driving us. And uh, we saw the swastika on the bottom of the wings and the chauffeur said, get out, you know, hide. So we each hid under a different bush, my father under one, the chauffeur under another. It was a field with some bushes in it. And my mother and I under another, and she was on top of me, I guess, to protect me. And I, I was saying, I don't want to die, I don't want to die. And afterwards, many years afterwards, she would tell this story. And I was so embarrassed that I was afraid. What a coward I was. I really didn't want to die. Um, anyway, uh, we finally arrived in Vilno. Well, first we went to Pinsk, and that's where the chauffeur said, goodbye, I'm not going any further. You know, my wife and children are in the country, I'm going back. So we stayed in Pinsk a little bit, but there were too many Jews in Pinsk, and as the Germans were advancing, the mayor and the, uh, the council of Pinsk said all the Jews had to get out. So we left Pinsk, and there we went with these horse-drawn carts and whatever to Vilno, and then we were in Vilno, which changed hands between the Lithuanians and the Russians, and we were there for, well, I don't know, maybe eight months or so. There are many stories about Vilno, but I'm not gonna go into them. But uh, in Vilno, which was next to what was then called Kovno and is now called Kaunas, Lithuania, um, how did we live there? Well, first of all, the Jewish agency, and it was uh, Hyas and Ort, and uh, um, they supported us. I mean, they supported the Jews. It was just really miraculous how incredible those agencies were. Uh, my mother, I guess, had grabbed some jewelry which she sold on the black market. Um, so somehow or other with the support, you know, we made it for a few months in Vilno. But in the meantime, Chuna Sugihara, 
was the Japanese consul in Lithuania, and all the other consulates were closed. This was in the summer of 1940, around 41, 1940. And he was still there, that consulate was still there. And some Jews uh, got the idea that they could maybe get a transit visa out of um, Vilno to go through Japan. Now, to get a transit visa, you had to have a destination visa. And there was a Dutch student who went to the Dutch consulate, uh, uh, and the Dutch consul was Zvart, a man called Zvartendik. Did any of you hear of him? Yes. No, his name was Zvartendik. And this Dutch uh, yeshiva student, he said, I want to go to Curaçao, which was a Dutch colony. And uh, Zvartendik said, well, you don't need a visa to the Curaçao. All you need is the governor of the island to let you land. And he said, well, could you write in my passport, no visa to Curaçao required? So the Dutch consul wrote that in his visa, and armed with that, he went to Sugihara, and he said, I have a transit visa. I'm going to Curaçao. And Sugihara signed this visa. It was a legitimate transit visa. Well, the word spread, and before you know, much happened, there were hundreds of people. Are we on the next slide? Could you put the next slide on? Yeah, that's Juna Sugihara, and these are the people that were, that were um, lining up in front of the consulate. Uh, look at that gate, because I'm going to show it to you again. They were lining up in front to, to try and get this visa from Sugihara. At this point, he had hundreds of people begging him for a visa, and he couldn't really do it, so he cabled Japan. And by the way, nobody knew where Curaçao was. Uh, and there were a lot of fake uh, things, no visa to Curaçao required. I, by the way, went to Curaçao many years after, and it's, well, it's another story, but anyway. <laughs> um, so hundreds of these people, so he cabled Japan, and, and they, uh, the minister, foreign minister said, no, you can't issue visas to Jews. Time, he cabled again, he cabled again, he cabled three times. He was, each time he was told not to do it. But things were getting really desperate and he decided he would do it. And the Mir Yeshiva was very instrumental in that. In fact, they helped him write these visas because he only had a few days to do it in. And you know, he, his hand was, uh, he couldn't physically even do it. And he had a German aide in the embassy. And this German aide actually organized it so that they would come you know, he got the stamp and he, he got the whole thing. It was remarkable. So he issued all those visas. Could you put the next slide in? This is a cop. Next, yeah. So this is this is the desk where he issued those visas. This is where he signed the visas. Next slide. And this is the list. As you can see, it's a copy of the original list. It's written in a, on a typewriter. Um, and our Ours was number 459, Alexander Haftka. Um, now, uh, uh, why did he get this? Well, again, that comes a little later. So we had this visa 459. Now, we still couldn't get out because um, uh, you had to have an exit permit from Russia. And Sugihara, actually, it is said that he went to the Russians and he worked out a deal with them where they would give these exit permits. Uh, we then went on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Next slide. Uh, this is the visa, my father's visa. And this is that passport. And you can see, seen for the journey through Japan, Curaçao to Curaçao, 1940. So that was a very useful fiction. Uh, OK, next slide, please. OK, next, if you just put the arrows. So we went from Lithuania to Moscow. And in Moscow, we went to the American consulate. And my father was able to get a visa to America. Now, uh, no countries were really accepting the Jews. And you couldn't go to Palestine, because the British were not allowing Jews to land in Palestine. Uh, so it, it was miraculous that we got a visa to America. And that happened because Roosevelt issued 
I don't know how many, I've been uh, ever since trying to get that list of Roosevelt's, if anybody knows how to do it. I even went to the Hyde Park archives to look for it. But there were something like 700 people on that list. And the Mir Yeshiva people were on it. And uh, some other Polish people who had been intellect Jewish intellectuals. Um, Someone got to Roosevelt, maybe Mrs. Roosevelt, and convinced him that you know this culture had to be saved. So these were some special visas, and that's what allowed us to go to America. Next, next. And so we went across Siberia, next, to Vladivostok. And that's the further, further east, furthermost east point on the continent. And from there, we went to Tsuruga, the Japanese port of Tsuruga, on a very cold day in December on a very stormy sea, but we landed in Japan. And uh, from Tsuruga, we stayed there a couple of days, then went to Kobe, Japan. And everything was good then because they were no longer afraid and there was no tension. We felt we were safe. We were gonna eventually get to America. Um, so things were good. And the Japanese were actually very good to us. Next slide, please. They took a sightseeing, and here on the bottom you see my mother, myself, and my father, and some friends visiting Kiyomizu Temple in Japan in 1941. And from there, about we were in Japan about four months, and again there was a committee in Kobe called JUKAM, the Jewish Committee. And they maintained the people there and helped them, helped us. Um, and helped us to secure tickets on a freight boat to America. And uh, next slide. This is me on the boat to America, <laughs> looking very much like an immigrant. Next. And uh, my parents dancing on the boat to America. So things were improving. And we went to Seattle. Um, and from Seattle, next slide. This is the map of the journey that we took. Next, the arrows from there, across Russia, across to Japan, and then across, keep going, and then across, keep going, <laughs> <laughs> to, to Seattle, and then across from Seattle to New York, where we finally settled, and that's where I grew up, in New York City. Uh, my parents had a hard time. They struggled to make a living. And again, Hyas and Ort were extraordinarily um, helpful to the refugees. And they managed, they somehow managed. Uh, my father placed a great value on education, and that's no surprise. It's one of the main Jewish values. And of course, I'm eternally grateful to him for that. And I went on to get a doctorate, but he unfortunately did not live to see it. Um, but nevertheless, I owe everything really to him and to my mother. Eventually, next slide, I donated the passport to the mayor of Yaotsu at the time. Subsequently, he went to jail for corruption, but this was, <laughs> <laughs> at this time he was, uh, very happy to receive the passport because they were going to build a museum. And this was at an uh, at a international symposium. I don't want to run out of time, but I'll just tell you a little thing. There was a woman there who um, brought a little boy to this symposium. And afterwards, this little boy asked questions about, about this thing. And I said to this woman, because there were also scientific talks at the symposium, I said, you brought this, your nine-year-old son here. She was an English teacher, so she spoke English. He must be so bored. And she said, no, no, it's very important that he should have a hero to look up to. Anyway, that inspired me when I got back to start this contest called Sugihara Do the Right Thing. And it was a contest that was sponsored by, that was co-sponsored by the uh, New York Board of Education for high school students who had to write an essay on some moral choice that they made any moral choice. You know, we, we, we don't have to save a million lives, but we have moral choices every day of our lives, probably. So this contest ran for a while, and then ADL took it over for a while, and then, um, then the students told each other <laughs> what to write, and we got a lot of stuff about uh, drugs and abortion. It was not in the spirit of the contest, so 
it changed, uh, it changed it a little bit. But I have to say that it then spread to San Francisco and Boston. But now my, uh, my nephew-in-law who lives in San Francisco and uh, sponsors a, a charity, a, a charitable organization in Kenya and Nairobi um, and, uh, and in another country there, I'm not sure which one, it's called Shafkos, Shining Hope of Communities, and it's a school for young people. And he has brought that contest to Africa. So that was really a, a thrill. And it, uh, this is the butterfly effect. It all started with this little kid coming, this mother bringing this little kid to, to the symposium. So it's kind of amazing. All right, next slide, please. Um, Eventually, I met Mrs. Sugihara. That's Mrs. Sugihara there in the yellow dress. She smoked like a chimney. <laughs> but she lived to a very ripe age. Uh, and then uh, they did build that museum eventually, the one I had some years before donated the passport. And I was part of the ribbon cutting ceremony over on the left, and she's there in the middle in the ribbon. So that was a thrill. But Next, please. My greatest thrill came in 2017. Oh, well, no, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. This was also 2017 when I went back to Kaunas. Um, they were making a documentary. This is, the, this is the consulate that Sugihara was in. And that is the desk where he signed those visas. So I stood at his desk. And that was a pretty amazing experience. OK, next slide. But my biggest thrill was when, and also in 2017, in the summer, when I went to Japan with my son, daughter-in-law, and granddaughter. And there we are, over on the right, standing in the very same spot with my granddaughter, where I stood with my parents in 1941. So that was really a major, major thrill, uh, and I'm very happy. Now, in the meantime, what happened to the rest of my mother's family and my family? My mother's um, brothers, were they remained in Jarki, and they were hidden by some uh, Polish uh, people in the village who hid them in the barns and so on. One of them joined the partisans, and they survived the war that way. Uh, I had a cousin. And her parents gave her to a, a, um, a convent. And the nuns raised her. And she was raised as a Catholic. But uh, after the war, her parents found her again and claimed her. And amazingly, she became an Orthodox Jew, <laughs> which was really quite amazing. My, uh, my other cousin. Um, was sent to Auschwitz together with his mother and brother and father. His brother and father were killed there, but he and his mother survived, and he wrote a book called Survivor's Club. You may have heard of it. Um, he has four children, each of whom have three children, so he really survived the war. But he, he did not escape the horrors that we escaped. He was, I think he was five when he was liberated from Auschwitz. My aunt, who lived with us in that apartment in Warsaw when we left, she didn't want to leave with us because she, she was the only man that so many men had left, and she was managing an office. And she said, I can't leave. <laughs> um, so she ended up in Majdanek and on the death march and with all kinds of horrendous things. But she survived the death march, and she was liberated by the Russians, then went to Cuba. and. Um, she survived, and her she had a daughter in America, who also has two children. And so, anyway, that's what happened. Uh, what happened to them? Um, okay. So most of these stories and many others appear in this novel, Chance and Consequence, that some of you have read or some of you have. I just want to tell you that this is the same novel as. This one, which was published originally under the name Rachel and Alex. Rachel and Alex stood for the names of my parents. But in 2017, when I went to Poland with the pictures I showed you, um, I wrote an epilogue because it was a very interesting trip. 
um, and it really visited all the places that were mentioned. So this was republished under this title with the epilogue in it. Okay, so we, now we get to Sugihara. The, the, really, the endlessly fascinating thing is, why did he do it? Why did he do, he didn't know these people, he had no obligation to these people. In fact, uh, Japan was about to be an ally with Germany. He was told not to do it. There was a culture of obedience in Japan. You don't go above your superiors. But he did it anyway because his conscience dictated that he do it. So he was quite simply a decent man. And I think it's a, just a matter of character. He did not act out of his character. One sometimes wonders whether in some act of bravery is a result of some spontaneous um, impulse that comes out of nothing. I don't think it comes out of nothing. I think it comes out of a lifetime of making choices. And that's why it's so important that we make these small choices. And, you know, we're not, thank God, we're not usually called upon to make choices of the magnitude of Sugihara or, or the other people who, who hid Jews at the peril of their own lives. Uh, but we do have choices like that every day of our lives, and I call those choices small decencies. And I think that if, if we transmit to our young people the need to do small decencies throughout life, it becomes a habit. And then if ever a big thing comes, it's part of our character. Because after all, we are the sum of all the choices that we make. Uh, if we make more good choices than bad choices, that's good. Everyone makes some bad choices, but it's the balance that counts. So I think that Sugihara uh, was a man who, who had a certain code. Of course, he had the samurai code. You know, he was, he was a samurai. And he had this code of behavior. You behave in a certain honorable way. And all of that accumulated. So when he was faced with this uh, momentous thing that he did, he acted within his character, not outside of his character. And I hope that we can transmit that to all you young people who are sitting back there. Think about the small choices you make in your lives. Um, and think about and think about all the indecencies and how equally important as, as doing the small decencies is stopping the indecencies. Very often we don't, you know, we just stay silent. Well, it's important to stop them in their tracks because as I said, the Holocaust didn't start with, uh, didn't start with the concentration camp. So the butterfly effect, that takes me back to the butterfly effect. Have we got the next slide? Could you put the next slide on? So the butterfly effect comes out of a scientific concept, chaos theory, and out of weather prediction. Uh, you know, if a butterfly flaps its wings in Asia, you can get a, a hurricane in, in Kansas because it amplifies over space and time. And that's what happens with uh, certain things that we do, the good things and the bad things. But the good things multiply over space and time. And uh, in, my, in my case, <laughs> um, and, uh, I mean, when you think about it, those 2,000 or so visas were each for a family. So maybe uh, it was been estimated that 6,000 people were saved. And now there may be 40 to 100,000 descendants. And if you think about how many teachers, lawyers, doctors, scholars, craftsmen, artists, musicians, uh, there are, as a result of that flapping of Sugihara's wings, you, you can see what a huge effect one act can have throughout, through time and space. But of course, it's not only it's not it's 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 not only the flapping of those wings. It's also a lot of chance. You know, every Holocaust uh, survivor um, has a story that that rests on some, con some, some coincidences, some chance, small chance events that you wouldn't even think about that led to, to one thing or another. So we were lucky because by chance we were 
in that two-week period that he wrote the visas, we were there. In that two-week period, he was there. And then all along, we're all, we got through Siberia, we got through whatever. So a lot of chance was there, but so was that seminal event where he made it possible. It was the fulcrum where he made it possible. So in my case, I, I'm happy to say my son is a genetic psychiatrist and has done a lot of good and is doing a lot of good. My granddaughter was just bat mitzvah uh, last, uh, last year. And uh, I'm, as a matter of fact, her mother was not Jewish and she converted. And her mother um, has a brother and a sister, both of whom converted. So all three children in that family converted to Judaism. And she and my son brought up my granddaughter Jewish and happily we all celebrated her bat mitzvah. So I'm very grateful to Sugihara and um, I think that's really all I want to say. I'm, I'm happy that you're all here, and uh, I'm happy that both Chance and the result of Kansu Sugihara's doing the right thing allowed me to be here tonight. Thank you. Sylvia, thank you so much. For, for speaking, for sharing. Um, you've earned a break if you want to sit for the questions. You don't have to. So I want us to take some questions for Sylvia about her life, about her experience, about um, any of the ideas that she's shared with us tonight. So I have one microphone to take around. So if you have a question, raise your hand. I will uh, come and find you. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sofia Grandakovska. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful le uh, lecture pre presentation and sharing your unique experience with all of us. I'm very much interested to know while you were uh, traveling during that time from continents to continents and countries to countries, how much you were able to hear information about what was going on, let's say, in uh, uh, the other parts of Europe uh, about the Holocaust uh, event that took the entire continent, uh, not only about Poland, but also about, let's say, uh, horrible things that were happening in uh, disembodied Yugoslavia, um, uh, independent uh, uh, state of Croatia, Jasenovac, and all those things that were happening during that time. Thank you. Well, of course, I was a very small child, so I didn't hear about that. Did my parents hear about it? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, I know many stories about you. I know a story from my husband about Yugoslavia. So I've heard these stories after the war from the refugees, but not during. I think something like 20,000 Jews escaped through China to Shanghai under Japanese occupation. And it was always my understanding that their feeling about the Jews had to do with the fact that Jacob Schiff underwrote the Russo-Japanese War. They, he financed the Japanese during the war. And for that reason, the Japanese had a feeling about the Jews, about their importance, which weighed in in that situation. I don't know whether Suji Hara was, you know, had that feeling also, but do you know about that? And what was the influence? I, I know about... Uh, about that, and I know that the Jews, many Jews went to Shanghai directly, but also what happened is, of course, 1941, Japan attacked the United States, and I guess just before that, they shipped all the Jews. Many Jews in our, in our group went to Shanghai, and there, some of them became very prosperous, and others died of typhus. So it was, it was, um, Again, chance and consequence. Um, 
But, but the Japanese, you know, as I've heard, they couldn't really, they, for, for one thing, they saw a lot of Orthodox Jews with the hats and the whatever, and they kind of admired that, I think, because they were traditionalist in some ways, but also I don't think they really distinguished between Jews and non-Jews. I don't think they were anti-Semitic. I mean, they may have done terrible things, but they were not, I don't think they were anti-Semitic. I don't think they really knew the difference. I don't know. Hillel, did you ever read Hillel Levine? He wrote a very good book uh, on Sugihara and what happened to the Jews in Japan. Um, well, no, I, I haven't read it, but I had a, a separate question, which is, um, I was fascinated by the fact that you uh, wrote a book about statistics and you called your talk The Butterfly Effect. So your, your, your story is so unique and so singular and so uh, improbable, like you were talking about the, uh, the odds of it happening or the, um, the chance, and yet you decided to write about statistics or to study statistics, which is sort of the science of repeated events and making sense of probabilities and, and happenstance in a way. So I just wondered if you had a thought about the difference between singularity and chance and, and your, your study of statistics. Well, you know, they say chance favors the prepared mind, right? So there's certain things that can nudge chance along. But um, I do find statistics very appealing. It's part of my profession, of course, which is why I wrote the book. With my son, by the way, which is really a, another great thrill. Um, but um, I, I find it very appealing. You know, it's the law of large numbers. You can't predict the probability for any individual, but you know, you know that there are going to be X number of accidents on, the Jul on July 4th but you can't predict who is going to have that accident. You can predict this, that if you don't get into a car, you won't have a car accident. <laughs> so there are some ways that you can nudge chance. But yeah, I find it very appealing. Um, hi, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, and my question for you is, once you moved to America, did you face anti-Semitism? I'm glad you asked that, because I was going to ask that of my, of my cousins, all of whom are, are, are um, very active now in, in um, what's going on in the world and in Israel. Uh, when I came to America, I did not know about anti-Semitism. It sounds ridiculous, but I really did not register it at all until I went to uh, the University of Wisconsin the summer between my, when I graduated from high school and before I went to college. And there I was met uh, at the station by the, prof by the chair of the Slavic department who had been a friend of my father's in Poland and who was not Jewish. And he took me and my friend with whom I went to uh, find a place to live for the summer uh, and he took me to a sorority house. And this, uh, so in those days, you know, you had a, a what did they call them? I, I want to say madam, but the house, house mother, I guess, right? <laughs> and the house mother, you know, welcomed us and there was a beautiful place. It had big flowers in the center hall. And she said, the girls here are so nice. You're going to have a lovely time. It's wonderful, please fill out this form. And on the form it said religion, and I put down Jewish, and my friend put down Jewish, and she looked at this, she looked at the form, she looked at this uh, department chair who had brought us, and she said, I'm terribly sorry, but we actually don't have any rooms left. So he was mortified, and he took us to a Jewish sorority where we found rooms. Um, but that was the first time that I encountered anti-Semitism. The other thing is, of course, I've been working almost all my professional life at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, which used to be part of Yeshiva University. It's now part of Montefiore Medical Center, but it's a, it was a very Jewish institution. So um, 
I've been coddled. <laughs> anyway, it's shocking to see what's going on now. Absolutely unbelievable that something that I hadn't encountered for decades and never thought I would encounter in America uh, is happening again, and it's, it's horrifying. I was wondering um, if you ever found out. <laughs> I was wondering if you ever found out what happened to Sugihara after the war, uh, if he ever faced repercussions. Yes, that's a very good question. He did. He actually was dismissed from the government for the quote unquote incident. Um, he then uh, became a businessman. He went to Russia. He became an importer or an exporter or an import, I don't know, he did some business in Russia. He even married a Russian woman. But, but um, uh, he, died, uh, he died unknown and unrecognized until someone in Israel, I think he was in Israel, found him again. He looked for him. I guess this must have been in the, maybe in the 60s or the 50s or 60s. And he found him and um, uh, he, he started the process whereby Sugihara was recognized in Yad Vashem as righteous among the nations. And then, of course, he kind of became a Japanese national hero because it's nice to have a hero <laughs> when you're... But the Japanese have been um, very eager to recognize Sugihara now. Once again, thank you for sharing this really fascinating, moving story. It really got me wondering, how did your experiences as a child living through the events of the war impact the way you saw the rest of the world, others, and yourself the rest of your life? I'm sorry. Can you just repeat the, question, the actual question? Yeah. How did your experiences as a child living through the events of war impact the way you saw the rest of the world, others, and yourself for the rest of your life? Hmm. That's a wonderful Just question. Just a little question. I sometimes wonder how long the reach of the Holocaust is. Is it to my son? My First of all, I was an outsider, and I was always an outsider. Uh, I didn't mind being an outsider. I finally became truly American, I think, when I, my first husband died when he was very young. He was 39, and my son was six years old. I remarried several years later. Uh, my first husband was Polish, and he and his family had come here in 1939, just be, 1938, or thir just before the war, ostensibly to see the World's Fair. The whole family came, but he was Polish. Uh, so after he died and several years later, I married an American man. He was quintessentially American. He belonged to the Lions Club. He was a founder of his synagogue. He was a doctor. He was a founder of his synagogue in the small uh, suburb that we lived in. Um, and then I began to feel American. That was the first time, really. Now. I am very American. I know my way around. I know how to get things done. I know what's what. I'm so American. Yet, I am also European. And I'm also, um, I mean, it doesn't go away. And there is still that, a little bit of a sense of insecurity when I see what's happening now. But I can't really believe it. I can't believe it of America. Of course, they didn't believe it in Germany either, so I try to be careful about that. But yes, it's had an impact. It's made me a globalist, for example. I'm completely a globalist. I think Brexit was dreadful. Um, uh, has it impacted my son? I think it has impacted my son. Of course, he was born in America. He was raised in America. But somewhere in there is also that same kind of feeling. Now, my granddaughter, probably not. I would say she's maybe free of it. I'm not sure. 
I'm not sure, but it's a long reach, and it does go on for generations. I sometimes wonder, though, what would, I, what would life have been like had I had a normal, happy childhood? And then I look around at some friends, or I did when I was younger, and I thought, you know, they're not any happier than I am. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. It's a tough question. So um, I have a question for you. I'm kind of sitting right here, if you can't see me. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, one, I am also uh, a, a child of a Holocaust survivor. And so, in a sense, I believe, as you say, that there is no way that you can ever let it go. In fact, my issue has always been that, although my father told me the stories repeatedly and over and over again, I kept forgetting them. And I had to hear them again and again and finally he wrote a book and then I knew what the story was. It was like he wanted to just cut it off. But that's not my question. My question is, I think, an interesting one. It has to do with genetics. Because in Kingston, there is a lady who was brought to the United States and she's been supported all her life by, I don't know exactly which Jewish foundation for being a hero and for saving Jews during World War II. She has a son, and he's a skinhead and a Nazi. And I'm curious as to whether this is in some form or another related to genetics and whether genetics can, we know genetics pass on lots of different traits, whether this would also be something that could happen. It's a complicated question. It's a very complicated, and the answer always is the same. It's nature and nurture. It's not nature or nurture, it's nature and nurture. So he must have had some tendencies, not to be a skinhead, but something that underlies being a skinhead, and then something in his environment triggered it. But there are inexplicable things that happen. Sophia, next question is up here. Um, hello. I understand that you were a very small child when you made the whole journey to America. And I was just wondering, when did you look back and realize the weight of Sugihara's actions? Like, was it through small reflections or was there could suddenly you, could this... You just hold the mic a oh. little further away from you. Because Sorry. You um, I was just wondering, because you were such a small child when you made the whole journey to America, when did you f um, first realize the weight of Sugihara's actions? Like, was it through small reflections, or was it a sudden epiphany that you realized that small decencies have um, such a weight on our character and our um, lives as a whole? Well, that's a very interesting question. First of all, when did I even first hear about Sugihara? There was a, a Rabbi Tokayer. Did anyone hear of Rabbi Tokayer? He, li he, used to, he lived in Long Island. Uh, Rabbi Berman, have you heard of Rabbi Tokayer? By reputation, but By I never reputation. met him. I met him once. He wrote a book called The Fugu Plan, which was later republished under the title Desperate Voyagers. And my very closest friend, when I was a young adult, gave me that book. And I said, oh my God, this is the story of my family. And that was really the first time, because my parents actually did not talk about it. They did not talk about it. So that was the first time that I really learned about Sugihara. And from there on in, you know, I had many connections to Japan. I went to Japan. There was the passport. My husband's roommate in college was a Japanese man with whom I became very friendly. Um, so uh, now when did I start thinking about the small decencies? I think I started thinking about what made Sugihara do you know, what he did, maybe around the time that we started that contest, because I was thinking, what do young people do? And I have to tell you one of, the favorite, one of my favorite stories in that contest that won a prize, lo very long ago this is now. It was about a, a student who was in a playground, in a high school playground, and uh, there was a, 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 a child with Down syndrome, 
an, an intellectually challenged child. And there was a group of older kids playing basketball. And, and uh, the child with a disability picked up the bottle cap that was on the playground and brought it to the kids who were playing basketball. And they started throwing that bottle cap across the basketball court. And he would run after it and pick it up like a dog you know, and bring it back to them. And a crowd gathered, and they were all laughing as this kid was running after uh, this bottle cap and bringing it back to these bullies. And then somebody in that crowd said, the person who wrote the essay, stop, what did he ever do to you? Leave him alone. And then one by one, they, you know, they became ashamed and they dispersed and they left him alone. But it took that one person you know, to say something and to risk being unpopular or whatever, but just to say something. So that started me to think that, you know, that, well, that was one of the essays, so I had thought about it before, but that's the kind of thing that, you know, that I was thinking about Sugihara. But, you know, it's a mis the mystery of goodness. There was, in fact, a, a symposium on that. What is the mystery of goodness? All right, one more question over on the other side now. Hi, how are you? Thank you for your presentation. It was really uh, fantastic. I said a question about what you said before, that you felt that you can't believe that it. it's happening here now, that anti-Semitism. And you thank Stuyvesant High School. Most of the kids that are here, the students, are juniors or they're seniors. They're going to be on college campuses, a lot of them in a couple of months. And when you said it's happening here, I think you're referring to like the rise in anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, and you were talking about moral choices. So my question for you, and I wanted to know if you had any advice for the students who are sitting here when they go onto campus in September and they see the kids in the dorm next to them, the kids are sitting in the cafeteria holding up signs that say from the river to the sea or that decolonization is in a metaphor or by any means necessary, professors saying they're exhilarated after the October 7th attacks. What moral choices or what, what things should the kids be thinking about, the students, as they are sitting next to those kids on those campuses are gonna be holding up those signs? Well, being a rationalist, um, I would hope that they would be able to engage in a conversation. Because, you know, if you avoid the conversation, you leave the field to the people who are having their one-sided conversation. But I know that it's very difficult to have these conversations, uh, especially depending on how the other side reacts. So it's, it's a question I would like, frankly, I would like to know the answer to. If you have any answers to that, I would love to hear it. <laughs> but um, maybe some others of you have some answers to that. It, it's, it's certainly a dilemma that students face. But it, it can't be ignored, but it also can't be met with, with, uh, you know, with its own blindness. Hi, uh, so my father was also a Holocaust survivor, but he never talked about it. So I wanna ask, what do you think your father would say now about what's happening now? He would be horrified. You know, when he was in Poland, he, he was what he called acculturated and what some people might call assimilated. He had a very strong Jewish identity uh, for which he got dismissed from the government. He was not religious. He was, he was Polish, just as I am American. And he believed that, that he had to fight it from, fight the anti-Semitism from within, not to leave the field. Of course, he left the field, and which is why I'm alive. But he, he, he believed that. What would he say now? I guess he would speak out about it as much as he could, and he would be, he would be horrified. Where, where did you come from? Where were you a survivor of? Uh, he was from Poland also. From Poland. The town was Losecha, L-O-S-I-C-E. Lodz? Losecha, I-C-E. Losecha, Losecha. Hi, my mom was also a Holocaust survivor. My mom grew up in Dresden, Germany. My grandfather was very creative. He brought his wife and his daughter here at six years of age 
in 1939, he ran a fish store in the Bronx, and he had saved up enough money to bring them here. Um, what kinds of stories do you have that you shared with your son? You, I gather you only have one child. Are there any other stories that you could share with these teenagers so they can see that your life, life was not a simple one? Lots of stories, but not only my story. Of course, I've shared all of this with my son and my stepsons as well. Um, but uh, there are lots of stories. There are stories about my husband who was on the kinder transport uh, and, and stories about my uh, uh, other relatives and so on. Lots and lots of stories. I hope that they hear them all. I hope that they hear them all. <coughs> it is important, I think, to have these stories out there. Well, and Sylvia, we're going to wrap up right now. Um, but Sylvia, we want to thank you so much for sharing your stories with us. This has been a real treat. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Friends, thank you so much for being here. This is, we are in the final few years that we'll get to hear from people who lived these experiences, who didn't just hear about them from parents or read about them in books. I encourage you to show up whenever you have an opportunity to hear from a survivor, from a refugee of the Nazi regime. Um, and I hope that you'll consider coming back and joining us in the spring when we commemorate Yom HaShoah with an interfaith service, especially our teenage friends here. I hope you will all come back and join us again in the spring. Thank you everybody for being here and thank you, Sylvia.